I know it's probably the end of a very long day, so I really appreciate all of you coming by to check out this presentation. Um, my name is Sean Quigley. Um, you can probably take a guess as to which organization I work for. <laughs> but um, so I specifically work with the National Parks of Boston. Um, and within the National Parks of Boston, I have spent the majority of my career specifically focused on uh, Boston African American National Historic Site, uh, which is located on the north slope of Beacon Hill, exploring the history of Boston's free African American community that lived there from roughly the revolution through the American Civil War. So really a focus on not only a fight against the institution of slavery, but also a fight for civil rights. So that was kind of the backdrop as to how I came into this project here. Um, I was initially tasked in the summer of 2017. Um, but a month after Charlottesville, what had occurred there, the debate about memorials and monuments, markers, um, commemorating the Confederacy during the American Civil War really had been something that, you know, was thrust onto the national conscience. And that was something that was felt not only nationally, but locally in many communities, where people kind of had to come together and look at these things that maybe they had forgotten, maybe they had just ignored, maybe they had just walked past on their way to work and really kind of assess what these things meant, what they stood for, and whether these are something that we want to be maintained in our communities. Um, and you wouldn't think Boston would have something like this, but it did. Uh, actually, the gentleman you see sitting right over there, uh, Kevin Levin, wrote an article on this in 2013. And as far as I can tell, that was the only thing that was written on it. Um, after it had been put up in the 1960s. Most people wouldn't think that you have a Confederate uh, marker in Boston, but we did. What you see here is a memorial um, to 13 Confederate soldiers that died in Fort Warren, which was during the American Civil War. It's located today on George's Island. You can go out and visit it. It was a Confederate prison. This marker was put up by a few different organizations. One of the more prominent organizations um, that we'll be talking about a lot today is the Daughters of the Confederacy, um, an organization that you know, most associate with the southern United States but had a chapter here in Boston. So besides Kevin's article, when people discovered this, we didn't really have anything on it. And I was part of a team that was tasked to research this marker, figure out where it came from, who put it there, why it was there, and you know, a general kind of assessment of this piece and a history of it. And that summer, it really kind of sent me, sent me on a journey that uh, you know, helped me explore and I think understand more about these markers, more about the monuments, their place in history, the organizations that put them up there, and what they mean. Uh, now, also, <laughs> once again, stealing from Kevin a little bit here, he gave a phenomenal presentation on Confederate markers in general. Mine's a little bit more focused on Boston, but similar to Kevin, I really appreciate the approach of presenting facts, not my opinion. What I'm, I'm not going to tell you whether I think Confederate markers should be removed or whether they should be maintained. What I'm here to do is to talk about these markers in Boston through that lens, looking at a national context of organizations that are putting up Confederate markers, um, why they're there, what was the purpose behind them, and um, that decision whether or not you know, they should be removed or they should be maintained, I think, is left for everyone in this room to decide. So as I began researching this, this was put up, um, as I said, in um, 18, uh, 1963 as part of the centennial of the American Civil War. But as I was researching this, one of the first things that I came across and discovered was that, was that this was actually not the first marker on George's Island dedicated to the Confederacy. 
The first one was dedicated in 1935. And the story behind this one and the ceremony that took place when that marker was put on George's Island, I think is really remarkable. So what you're looking at right here are two articles from the Boston Globe from 1935. The Bostonian Society uh, was planning an event um, with an individual by the name of Edward Rose Snow, who was kind of spearheading the effort to put this, uh, get this plaque out on George's Island. And this was 1935. Veterans of the American Civil War, though small in number, were still alive. So as a part of this ceremony, what Snow looks to do, and as you can see here with these Boston Globe articles, Confederate veteran wanted his guest. During the ceremony, Snow in the Bostonian Society, Daughters of the Confederacy, GAR, the Army, there's a lot of people involved in this. They actually have two people by the name of William Newell, who was a Confederate veteran, and Charles Robinson, a Union veteran. Symbolically, shake hands under this marker. Snow called it the most impressive part of the ceremony. Now, this marker wasn't as big as this one, but rather, it was just a plaque. It was a plaque that was put in a room that was a prison cell. And in this prison cell, as you can see here with this image, you have, once again, kind of that symbolism, the American flag, the Confederate flag draped over this image, which is kind of hard to see. Um, I'm sure some of you probably recognize him. But as you can see here, looking at this plaque, you have two Confederate diplomats that were imprisoned here, and Alexander H. Stevens, former vice president of the Confederacy, was imprisoned on George's Island at Fort Warren from roughly May of 1865 through October of 1865. So this is a plaque commemorating probably the most famous <coughs> Confederate diplomats, soldiers, you know, political people that would have been imprisoned at this fort. But I think one of the most remarkable things about this ceremony was that in addition to having a Confederate veteran and a Union veteran shake hands under this plaque, uh, there was also a letter that was read at this ceremony. And that letter was penned by, or signed actually, by Franklin Roosevelt, President of the United States at the time in 1935. Now this letter's short, um, but I think that this last paragraph here is, you know, it's really symbolic. Now, I'm gonna do a lot of talking today, so I always appreciate it when other, I hear other voices. Would anybody be willing to just read this sentence out loud? Uh, right there in the back. We have heard the last mutterings of the storm that more than 70 years ago swept over this country. The people of our land are now completely united in their devotion to the republic. Thank you. Last mutterings of the storm, completely devoted, united. This is the 1930s, you know, I mean, Jim Crow, segregation, it's at its height. But this speaks to a reunion, a reunion that is in living memory for those veterans of the American Civil War, you know, symbolically shaking hands. It, it, it really highlights this idea that the nation is healed. How do, you, how do you get there? How do you get into the 1930s when you you know, have the President of the United States saying that the nation has healed. Um, well, one of the major reasons why you have this, these events like what takes place on George's Island, though small, was an example of an event that was taking place all across the United States. Uh, and I think it's very symbolic of what we now refer to as the lost cause. I imagine there's probably going to be a lot of hands, but who here has heard of the Lost Cause before? Yeah. Does anybody 
Just what's like, what kind of is the lost cause? Any examples of it? Civil War was about states' rights, not about slavery. Yes. It's an idea that emerges immediately after the American Civil War, an idea that I think, and I think other historians have argued, is an idea that emerges to create meaning. When the American Civil War ends, four years of fighting, there are over 700,000 casualties. The southern United States is hit particularly hard. One out of every five men of military age in the South dies in these four years of fighting, 20% of that military population. This is obviously a devastating war. It is one that, you know, the carnage and the death is unprecedented. No one in this country has ever experienced anything like it. There needs to be meaning. And it's easier to justify the war if you're in the North. A, you won. B, the Union is preserved. And C, that Union is preserved without the institution of slavery. There's meaning in that. But how do you find meaning in a lost cause? Well, immediately emerging after the war, as you said, sir, this idea of states' rights. But also, it's something that um, some historians, uh, such as um, David Blight, have referred to as kind of, you know, a cult of the lost cause, if you will. Um, public memory, a cult of the fallen soldier, a righteous political cause defeated only by superior industrial might in a people forming a collective identity as victims and survivors. Trying to heal this nation, one thing that's in common between North and South for many people who fought in this war is a shared experience of horror, a shared experience of suffering, and ultimately, a shared experience of valor. And you begin to see, not immediately, but you begin to see as we move into the 1880s, 1890s, early 1900s, something similar to what takes place on George's Island, these idea of these blue and gray reunions. You know, veterans from both sides coming together to signify healing. And I think really the culmination of that idea of that blue and the gray reunion you can see right here. This is at the 50th anniversary of the Battle of Gettysburg. Uh, the United States really wanted to make this a national spectacle and really a worldwide spectacle, and they succeeded. Uh, the United States government paid about $1.75 million to transport any living veteran north or south to that field in Pennsylvania. Over 50,000 veterans will show up over this you know, multi-day extravagant ceremony and celebration. And this picture right here that you see, you know, these are old veterans, blue and gray, symbolically shaking hands over the stone wall that they had fought over during Pickett's Charge. You look at this narrative, though, and this experience, this reunion, What's missing? African Americans. Over 180,000 African Americans fought during the American Civil War. African Americans made up a tenth of the entire Union Army, were only allowed to fight for two years, and black men make up 1% of the North's entire population. The Union Army doesn't emerge victorious without African American soldiers. But by and large, these men, what they fought for, what the war was over, has shifted and changed. And they are largely pushed aside for that national healing of shared sacrifice. Now, as he often did, um, I think Frederick Douglass really captures this very well. In 1883, um, at a Memorial Day celebration, um, Douglas is speaking, and would uh, 
Anybody like to read this quote out loud for me? Yes. Whatever else I may forget, I shall never forget the difference between those who fought for liberty and those who fought for slavery. Thank you. As the abolitionists are dying off in the late 1800s, you know, Douglas among them, trying to keep that memory, what they felt the war was over, alive, this memory really begins to fade. So how does this lost cause ideology so really seep itself into our public conscience and our understanding of this conflict? Well, there were you know, many groups and individuals who were involved in making, you know, trying to maintain this idea of the lost cause, this idea of you know, that shared sacrifice, that idea of states' rights, trying to push slavery as far to the side as possible as a cause for the war. Uh, one way that that is done are public memorials, monuments, things that you walk past every day and see. And one organization that was crucial in making sure that these memorials and monuments are established is a group called the United Daughters of the Confederacy. So the United Daughters of the Confederacy um, is not the first um, women's group that is focusing on memorializing you know, um, veterans of the Civil War, specifically looking at the Confederacy. Um, but this is a very prominent one in regards to maintaining and creating monuments. The organization, um, this part of the organization is founded late 1890s, I think 1894, um, with 30 members. By the time you hit World War I, they have over 100,000. They're in multiple states, all over, not just in the south, in the north as well. There's a chapter here in Boston. So you can see here right at the bottom, this is uh, the UDC state meeting at Winthrop Hotel in Tacoma, Washington. So, you know, this is something that is all throughout the country. And their organization, according to their Articles of Incorporation, um, or kind of like their Constitution, uh, three main points. One, honor the memory of those who served and those who fell in the service of the Confederate States. Two, to protect, preserve, and mark the places made historic by Confederate valor. And three, to collect and preserve the material for a truthful history of the war between the states. And I think that that last part is extremely important because not only are the Daughters of the Confederacy focused on creating physical monuments to honor the idea of the lost cause, they're also creating what historian Karen Cox, who wrote a book about the Daughters of the Confederacy, refers to as living monuments. And I'm going to quote um, Professor Cox here. Um, the daughters regarded their efforts to educate children as their most important work as they sought to build living monuments who would grow up to defend states' rights and white supremacy. So this is an organization um, that not only is influencing the public landscape, but also schools, educational institutions, libraries. Um, this organization very much had an elitist bent. Um, a lot of the women here were very well connected um, with relatives or husbands or you know, spouses that were politicians, high-ranking Southern officials that, you know, when they wanted something done, this change could happen. Um, they created textbooks that were put in schools. Um, for example, the historian of the Daughters of the Confederacy, uh, I think her name was Laura Rose in the right around 1915, right around the time that the film Birth of a Nation comes out, uh, wrote this book, The Ku Klux Klan or Invisible Empire. And this was used as a supplementary text for students. Um, and it was adopted by the state of Mississippi. And encouraged by the Daughters of the Confederacy, um, unanimously approved and encouraged that other states use this as well. So these monuments, these, you know, these textbooks, this is something that is starting to educate people from a very young age. 
But not only did the daughters have their own organization, can pass these around, please? Thank you. They also had um, an organization that was called. Uh, they had chapters for children. Um, children all throughout the South uh, from ages 6 to 16 could be in this organization. And then once you're after 16, you could then potentially join the Sons of Confederate Veterans or the Daughters of Confederate Veterans. Does everybody have one? Thank you. So during these meetings with the Children of the Confederacy, one thing that they um, did, they had essay contests, um, you know, meetings where you talk about, you know, giving history lessons um, about the truthful history between, of the war between the states. But they also had, and what I just passed out to you is an example of it, um, what was known as a Confederate catchism. This is from 1929, and what this, what you have in front of you is an example of, is something that what they would do is at the very beginning of some of these meetings, or at the end, or at some point, uh, they would use these as like a call and response kind of method. Um, you know, where the teacher or the head of the organization would read a question, and everyone in unison would respond. So I figured, and I think one of the best ways to get the full effect of this, um, I'm going to read the first question. And I would like everybody to please read the answer out loud. Was slavery the cause of secession or the war? So, I mean, you think about when you're a kid, how impressionable an adult, an authority figure is telling you something. You hear that, that's ingrained. And if that's what you're taught, if that's what everyone's telling you, it's really hard to not think about that. It's really hard to not believe that that is true. But you look at that question, you read that answer, and it's, you know, kind of, it's really in direct conflict with what a lot of individuals, high-ranking Confederate officials, were saying when they seceded from the Union. So the man who was imprisoned at Fort Warren, the man who had the plaque, Alexander H. Stevens, in March of 1861, about a month before the first shots at Fort Sumter are fired, he gives a speech that is pretty famous. It's known as the Cornerstone Speech, identifying why the states are seceding and forming the Confederacy, leaving the Union. Our new government is founded upon exactly the opposite idea. Its foundations are laid, its cornerstone rests upon the great truth that the Negro is not equal to the white man, that slavery, subordination to the superior race, is his natural and normal condition. The South secedes to protect slavery to protect their rights to own other human beings as property. That's 1861. By 1929, this is a common narrative of the American Civil War. So the Daughters of the Confederacy, um, you know, not only are they an organization, as I said, that exists just in the South, but they are many places, including here in Boston. It's kind of hard to get access to their records, but from what I've uncovered, uh, the Boston chapter existed as early as 1917 and existed as late as 2003. And the Daughters of the Confederacy, as I said, they're not only involved in creating that plaque on George's Island, uh, 
but also that marker that appears in 1963 in the 100th anniversary of the Civil War. So here you see, this is, these are both from the Patriot Ledger. Um, here is work that is being done on that marker. Uh, and the ceremony takes place um, May 24th of 1863. And here is an image of the unveiling of that marker. Uh, now there were no, there was no letter from uh, you know, the president at that time. But according to the uh, bicentennial um, kind of pamphlet that was passed around, um, talking about this specific ceremony, the Massachusetts chapter of the United Daughters of the Confederacy, with the cooperation of the Civil War Centennial Commission, the Metropolitan District Commission, dedicated marker on Fort Warren, Boston Harbor, in memory of the Confederate prisoners of war who died there during the Civil War. The ceremony took place on May 24th so that assembly delegates from both the North and the South could participate in the spirit of unity. Um, there were about 280 people, according to the Patriot Ledger, at this ceremony. So this marker went up and pretty much was largely forgotten. It was a piece on George's Island that you, know, you walk past, and it just it, it didn't really register um, until, once again, um, the summer of 2017. So the marker during that summer was boarded up uh, and then removed from the island in October um, of 2018, so October of this year. Uh, that was a few kind of different people were invested in kind of looking at the removal of this. Um, one of the most notable was our governor, um, Charlie Baker. And a quote from his office in the Boston Globe said that Governor Baker believes that we should refrain, refrain from the display of symbols, especially in our public parts, that do not support liberty and equality for the people of Massachusetts. This marker is at the um, Massachusetts Archives right on the UMass Boston campus today. So this is obviously something that is difficult to talk about. Um, and it you know, stirs up a lot of emotion in people, rightfully so, I think, because it speaks to you know, something that we think is far in the past, the American Civil War, but still very much with us today. And I mean, you look at the idea of the lost cause, you look at some of the facts and the evidence, and you kind of say, you know, why, how could how could people get caught up in this? How could this be something that, you know, people believe? It's really easy. I mean, personally speaking, I believed it. This is me um, with a direct descendant of Jeb Stewart, the Confederate cavalry captain at the 150th anniversary of the Battle of Gettysburg. This would be 2013. Um, and I mean, it's ultimately, it's, it's an interesting story. I was fascinated with Civil War battlefields when I was a kid. I've been to Antietam. I've been to Gettysburg. I've been to Cold Harbor. I've been to Bull Run. You know, I've, I've been to a bunch of different places. I've seen the movie Gettysburg. I've read Killer Angels. And it's, it's easy to root for the underdog. And as I was growing up, I was reading these things. I was going to these places. And slavery was never at the forefront. Slavery was never talked about. This was something that, you know, it existed. Everyone agrees that it was bad. But this is a story of shared valor. This is a story of shared sacrifice. This is an American story of a nation tearing itself apart and then coming back together. And, you know, I mean, I, I enjoyed it. I really was fascinated by it. And, you know, I, I've read a lot of books since and have, as you can probably guess, changed my opinion greatly and kind of done a complete 180. But nonetheless, I use myself as an example to say that this is not something that's hard to get caught up into. Unless you know, you're really interested in history or a paid historian, you, know, you take what you learn in high school. And if you go to battlefields, you read The Waysides, you watch the movies, and you know, 
This could be very easily be a takeaway. So in conclusion, um, and then once we're done in one second, I'm more than happy to take some questions. I like to end this presentation, actually, uh, with a quote from W.E.B. Du Bois, um, who in the 1930s wrote a very long book on uh, the history of Reconstruction, which pretty much every single person in the scholarly world ignored when it came out. Um, but W.E.B. Du Bois has a really fascinating quote about history that I think is very relatable to what we've just talked about. If we are going to use history for our pleasure and amusement, for inflating our national ego, then we must give up the idea of history as a science, and admit frankly that we are using a version of historic fact in order to influence and educate the new generation along the way we wish. So thank you. Um, and if anybody has any questions, I'm more than happy to take them. Is the marker tucked away in the archives, or is it, or is it in the Commonwealth Museum that you can see it? As far as I know, I'm pretty sure that it is not on display. So I believe that it is in the archives and not in the museum. Yes, sir. I, I couldn't read it when you had it at the beginning. What does the marker actually say? What, what's the text on the marker? So that's a great question. So basically, what the marker says, and I'm apologize, I don't have it verbatim, um, but it basically, it identifies the 13 prisoners that died um, during the four years that Fort Warren existed as a prison. Um, and then it says basically they died in the war between the states, and it has the Daughters of the Confederacy um, identified on it. But that is, the focus of that marker was those 13 people who died. And it says war between the states. Yes, it does. It does. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yes. And the plaque that you showed at the beginning, the original one, that is that still um, there or? They, uh, they, 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 they believe it was stolen. Um, I've actually, so you can go in the room today. It was actually a room on George's Island for a while, and I've seen pictures of it. It's not called this anymore, but it was like, a, it was called the Confederate Shrine Room, because yeah. Stevens was buried in there. And, or not buried in there, excuse me. He was uh, imprisoned in there. And you can see on the wall by the fireplace, there's four holes. Uh, and there's an article in the New York Times from 1960 which talks about that they believe, they say they believe that it was stolen. Basically, the army owns that <coughs> fort and owns that island until the 1950s, gives it to the state. So it's a public park, but without a lot of staff out there. It, from what I've heard anyway, it was basically like people could go out and there's not really much oversight, so a lot of things. So just out of curiosity, are the, is there anywhere that says that these 13 soldiers died there? Um, off the top of my head, I, I think that there is, in the museum that they have when you go in the visitor center, um, there are a lot of waysides that talk about kind of the history of it. Um, and I can't 100% confirm, but I believe that that is something that is on the island. And also with the rangers and staff that are out there doing the tours of the fort, that is something that is brought up and discussed. Gettysburg changed? I haven't been uh, since <laughs> 2013, so I'm. Uh, so, I mean, there were a lot of memorials there, and there are memorials for Confederate soldiers, and there are Union soldiers. Yeah. 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 So, that I, yeah, that I can speak to in regards to the Park Service um, because it is a. With it being a national park, um, it would take, I believe, to remove monuments from it, really like legislation in order to remove anything. And also the Park Service is in the position of if there are rangers there, there are interpretive staff there, it's something that can be used as a talking point or a it, teaching tool. Just one overall comment about secession. The first discussion of secession took place during the War of 1812. And it began in New England, the New England Convention. And there were proposals made to secede from the Union of the New England States by the 
They never went forward with those proposals for an intervention. The war ended. But I think historically in America, that was the first discussion of secession. I, I, I don't think, uh, we don't teach that very often. I, I, I taught history for quite a while. And I always pointed that out to my students that the New Englanders had brought that topic forward initially. It was the South. Yeah, I mean, there were talks of secession all throughout. Pretty much, there were talks of secession when the Constitution was being written and the southern states didn't want to be a part of the Union if there were going to be, you know, major non-concessions to the institution of slavery. Abolitionists were threatening to leave the Union throughout the 1840s, 1850s. Um, pretty much from the Constitution to the... To the <laughs> Yeah, to the Civil War, I mean, there are, there are talks of secession coming from all, all throughout the country. But those were the two instances when it came to a head. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you very much. Yes? Um, one of the things that I often think about when thinking about Confederate monuments and monuments in general is whether a monument or a marker or a plaque like the ones that you showed uh, in itself constitute celebrating the thing that it's recognizing, celebrating the thing that it's talking about? Because I think there's some debate about, well, how are we going to know about it if we don't have a plaque? And I, I would argue maybe museum exhibits or maybe education or, you know, it doesn't have to be a plaque. And I, I think that plaques tend to be celebratory. My impression, based on the fact that it was the daughters of the Confederacy putting it up, is that they intended this to be a celebration of the people that, you know, a way of honoring um, the dead. And so my question is, is that your impression as well? And in your research, do you feel that that kind of bears out across other Confederate monuments as well, that it's intended to honor or celebrate the people and the ideas that they were fighting for? Yeah, I mean, I think, and I think specifically, like, looking at, especially, a lot of the markers and monuments. The 1963 one is, I think, a little bit different. It's definitely not within the heyday of when markers and monuments were put up. And during that heyday of when the markers and monuments put up, it it, I, it was to shape the narrative of the war. Yeah, I'm. Yeah, I mean, and it's you know these are. I think you look at the daughters of the Confederacy and their parents' generation and you know, grandparents' generation, they're the ones that fought in the war. And wanting to make sure, once again, I think it goes back to that idea of finding meaning. <coughs> you know, you want to make sure if there's a grandfather who's you know, missing a leg or you know, fought in a war, you want to make sure that that memory is preserved um, and justifying that. And I think that a lot of the markers and monuments that were put up were aimed to justify that cause, that idea of Southern viewpoint on why the war was fought. Yes? I just wondered if you came across other examples of, of the, the daughters influencing the movement. I, I wonder, you know, because of the tradition of abolition, how far do they get? Obviously, the story did change that. Another very good question. Um, I think, so, I, once again, the records of the Daughters of the Confederacy are not easily accessible. Um, and I've been able to kind of uncover, like, bits and pieces from, like, digitized things that talk about Boston. Um, I do know that the Boston chapter did offer the Boston Public Library to host or host the Library of the Confederacy which the daughters respectfully declined and kept in Virginia. But I don't, I don't know how big the organization was. Um, I'm not sure of how many members were in it. But you know, it, was a, it was a fairly vocal chapter that you, know, you look at the kind of meeting minutes of like annual conventions, and, and Boston is showing up. So it's active. It's involved. Um, and you know, maybe that influence isn't as great as in other places, but still, it was here. Yes. Uh, given that Stevens was a vice president of the Confederacy, it probably made very good sense 
if you were going to imprison them, you make it as far away from the Confederacy as possible. What about the rest of those guys? Were they just unlucky? Were they people of particular note somehow or another? A lot were Maryland politicians. Ah. Oh. oh. Yeah. Uh, Pro-slavery, pro-Confederacy politicians in Maryland who they basically lock up to keep that side from getting a quorum in the Maryland legislature. Ah. <laughs> yeah. So you have a lot of political prisoners as well as um, soldiers that were imprisoned there. And as far as, you know, I think what that 13 prisoners dying also speaks to is Fort Warren was probably one of the most humane prisons in the American Civil War. Um, I mean, Civil War prisons like Andersonville, they're pretty notorious for, you know, scores of people dying, whereas the largest complaint that comes out of Fort Warren is boredom. So it's, it's another thing where there's a lot of prisoners, there's a lot of people fighting, not a lot of places to put them. Fort Warren becomes one of those places. Yes. First, that was a really good presentation. I, I learned a lot. Um, I, and I agree with the way you frame this, the 1935 plaque, in terms of the broad issue of reunion and the racial climate. But I'm wondering if it also might be helpful to think about this within the more local racial context, because I'm, I mean, the obvious question is, how did a city that boasted one of the most significant black abolitionist centers in the entire country, right? I mean, right through the Civil War, I think of Douglas, Lewis, Aiden, they're recruiting black soldiers. How does a city like Boston allow a Confederate monument to be dedicated in the city limits? And you know, what comes to mind, of course, is that by the 1930s, Boston is one of the most segregated cities along racial lines in the country. I mean, even when the Shovel Memorial is dedicated in 1897, the black population is already being pushed off of the backside of Beacon Hill. So I'm just wondering, you know, what do you do with that? I mean, is there a way of sort of integrating this into the thinking about, um, well, I guess the dedication of both, um, both markers. When, is the, when are the protests over buses? That's the 35 case, um, people put up things all over the place all the time. There wasn't the same, um, yeah, I mean, now it's so, sort of extreme, but you know, when you look at who's on Commonwealth Avenue, there's some really bizarre, you know, <laughs> a gift from Argentina and stuff like that. So I think that but no maybe, Confederates. No, but I'm just saying people just were allowed to put things up. And I don't know who owned George's. Was that a state owned in 35 or federal? So the, the army owned it. The army owned it. You said it was, that. Yeah, right. it, was a, it was an actual, it was still a base. Federal. Yeah. yeah. So it was actually, it was the daughters, the army, and the grand army of the republic. So the GAR, which is a union army veterans association. And I think that's a really good question. And I think obviously that would, I'd have to kind of look a little bit more into that to speak to kind of the greater, you know, if that has any correlations to the racial climate in Boston in the 1930s. But I think kind of speaking a little bit towards the idea of markers being put up a bunch of places, I almost, and just this is just my personal opinion, I almost imagine it's, it's, it's an example of almost Boston kind of being like, we're healing too. This is, putting ourselves back in the 1930s, the idea of reconstruction is a failure in the idea of the country coming together over shared sacrifice is not only an accepted, you know, kind of definition of what occurred after and during the American Civil War, but that's some of the highest scholars are saying that. So that's in the conscience of everybody, pretty much, except for, you know, obviously, like people like W.B. Du Bois and um, many African, obviously, many African American scholars who are, you know, very aware of how false that that narrative is. But I, I would imagine that it, it would probably be because it's a, it's a part of like the nation coming together and it's Boston playing, although small with this plaque, it's playing its role in that. I personally think that people really underestimate how powerful uh, the movie Birth of a Nation was in selling the Lost Cause narrative even in the North. It was pretty controversial here in Boston. Mm -hmm. it, it was among black Bostonians. It was pretty widely accepted by white Bostonians. Uh, from what I've read about it in news articles, like, uh, there's a lot of a lot of protests among black folks. Yeah. Huge lines to see it on the lights. Yeah.
But this was kind of a not a, that objective for the army to put a monument to fallen soldiers. Period. You know, I would think. I think that's one of the interesting things is that um, monument doesn't mention any of the fallen soldiers. It mentions these three very high-level Confederate folks who were there. I was trying to read the names on, on the, the, the 1960s one, and it, the focus shifts from those elite men who were held there that didn't die to the soldiers who died. So it's focusing on that idea of sacrifice for I was going to say, I think to me there were a couple of things that were kind of interesting in the context of World War II. One of them, I think, is the, the Roosevelt quote. It seemed to me that was like trying to create unity in the country, right? In preparation for World War II, while everything was happening in Europe. Mm -hmm. But the other thing, too, is like I'm thinking Normandy, right? You know, they have the cemeteries dedicated to the deceased, the fallen soldiers from the Nazi side. Mm -hmm. And I personally find that just so moving to see that. So if you have a monument that, you know, you're kind of recognizing, that there, there's loss on both sides. You know, I, I think there's value in that. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Thank you, everybody.